Welcome to the first lecture in the uh, Studio Art Department's Winter Lecture Series. I'm Gerald Otten, and I direct the Studio Art Exhibition Program. Before Professor Guerin um, introduces our guest, uh, two things. First of all, please turn off every electrical device in your possession. <laughs> And second, please join us for a reception following the lecture in the Jaffe Freedy Gallery in the Hopkins Center. Brenda? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to introduce John Newman, who makes sculpture and drawings. He was born in Flushing, New York, and currently lives and works in New York City. He went to Oberlin College and received an MFA from Yale School of Art. I think we've heard of that. And he also attended the independent study program at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. He has taught at numerous universities, such as Virginia Commonwealth University, Colgate University, the New York Studio School of Painting and Sculpture, Bennington College, École Supérieure d'Art Visuel in Genève, Yale, and Queens College in New York City. And that's where I first met John. He was my professor for a course titled New Forms. And he had just recently gotten out of grad school, about six years. And he was one of those professors that was young and tough. Um, but we all learned something. And many of us are still making art today, so that says something. John has exhibited his work extensively for 40 years, and his resume is impressively long. You can get a good look at it in the gallery. So I'm just going to hit some of the highlights from this, his resume. He is represented by Tibor Dinaj Gallery in New York City. And most recently, he had a solo exhibition there in 2012. Other selected solo exhibitions include Texas Gallery in Houston, Instruments of Argument, the New York Studio School Gallery, Monkey Wrenches and Household Saints, Clifford Gallery at Colgate University, Contemporary Art Gallery, Ahmadabad, India, Gallery Fred Jan in Munich, Jason McCoy, New York City, Bobby Greenfield Gallery in LA, Gallery Schmeller in Dusseldorf, Helen Wetterling Gallery in Stockholm, and Gagosian Gallery, New York City. Now I'm just going to read you a few of the group exhibitions, and some of them include Invitational at the American Academy of Arts and Letters in New York City, Octet Para Museum in Istanbul, Pretty Strange, Louise Ross Gallery in New York City, Color International Print Center, New York City, Ideas and Objects, Selected Drawings and Sculptures from the Permanent Collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, Grounds for Sculpture at Johnson Atelier, New, New Jersey, Forms That Speak, Center for Contemporary Graphics, and the Tyler Graphics Archive in Fukushima, Japan. New Acquisitions, the New York Public Library, and Sister Varis Collection in Geneva, Switzerland. His work is included in many collections, and some are the Nasher Collection in Dallas, the Brooklyn Museum, the Albright Knox Gallery, the Fogg Art Museum, Fort Wayne Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Gallery of Berlin, the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Storm King Art Center, Walker Art Center, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, and of course, our very own, the Hood Museum of Art, and you can see one of his drawings that's installed in the gallery when you walk into the museum. So thank you, Michael, and everyone for installing that. Some of his awards and fellowships include the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Rome Price Fellowship, the Paulette Krasner Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, 
8 MIT Center for Advanced Visual Studies, Ballinglen Arts Foundation in Ireland, a senior research Fulbright to India, Yaddo and McDowell Colony. He has had reviews in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Art Forum, Art News, Sculpture Magazine, the Christian Science Monitor, and Art in America, and that's just a few. In the essay for the catalog of John Newman's exhibition here at Dartmouth, Steel Stillman wrote, a speculator in the most far-reaching sense. His sculptures are metaphors for what, for now, lies beyond our ken, and he posits connections that one day we may have words for. Please help me to welcome John Newman. Okay, thank you so much, Brenda, for that, and thank you, Brenda and Jerry, for being so welcoming and, I would say, perfect. And thank uh, Bonnie Barber and C.J. Liu for being so helpful and kind, and Michael Taylor and Catherine Hart from the Hood Museum for hanging the drawing and having me here. Apparently, I gave a talk here 20 years ago, and don't really remember it. Um, but I'd like to take the opportunity tonight to try out something a little different, rather than the usual chronological review. 30 years of work, you've had the talk before, I'm sure. I did my first piece here, I did my next piece there. By the time you get to the, to the end, <coughs> by the time you get to the new work, it's all a bit, everyone's a bit ready for the talk to end, including me. The kind of talk I've given a million times, and I'm sure you've all heard a million times. I thought this would be a nice opportunity, for me at least, to just talk about somewhat recent work and isolate some of the ideas I've been kicking around. So I hope you'll indulge me. I heard that Sartre said that philosophy is about everything in general and nothing in specific. And I suppose it would be a little too easy here to say then that sculpture is about everything in specific and nothing in general. The sculptor Donald Judd said it better. He said, sculpture is here, and in that, it has everything going for it. But in fact, I would like to talk about some th things in general. What I've admired and envied about the world of painting is that there is a pretty well agreed upon sense of what a painting is, how it is made, and how it is presented to us. It doesn't matter which paintings, we, which painters we are referring to, there is a general consensus regarding the identity of a painting. This does not diminish its possibilities, by the way, far from it. As the linguist Alexander von Humboldt said about language, this works so well because it, meaning painting in this case, has the infinite use of finite means. Sculpture really, since the turn of the 20th century, when painters began making lightweight three-dimensional constructions, but especially in the 1960s, sculpture became this big umbrella enterprise that housed all kinds of artists' extended activities that were not painting. Video, installation, performance, even some photography. Also, the recent attention on new media, social relevancy, and spectacle has moved the focus of certain artwork towards an entertainment industry model and the contemplative, and singular, the contemplative power and singularity of sculpture as a field have naturally become muddled. The good side of this welcoming umbrella that we now call sculpture shelters and supports the ever-expanding and multi-directional evolution necessary for contemporary art to proceed. The downside is possibly we just don't know what is what today, and knowing how to make informed judgments becomes quite challenging. But that's a little broad to take on right here. In regard to my own work, around 20 years ago, I started doing a lot of traveling abroad, particularly in the third world. The motivation for this was in one sense to deflect the distractions and exigencies of teaching and administration. I was the director of the Yale Sculpture Program in the 90s. 
a time when multiculturalism and identity politics manifested by research-driven installations were at a fever pitch in the art world and amongst my students. At that time, I was doing some very fundamental questioning about my own work. For years, I had been making large-scale and costly fabricated sculptures. And as much as I enjoyed the symphony-like busyness of having many assistants and fabricators and trucks and cranes, I felt something missing. And like any good farmer who feels that the minerals have been depleted from overplanting, I went to look for another hill. Uh, when I was traveling, I would make these little drawings because that was pretty much all I could make. These drawings were just fantasy speculations on a sculptural form that was never supposed to be realized. And I had the added benefit in that they were imaginary constructions. I didn't need to have to worry about gravity, stance, adhesion, or materials. So I could fool around and render something improbable or draw implied movement or smoke or liquid for that matter. These drawings are about eight and a half by 11 inches, what we used to call typing paper size. What imp I'm trying to get a couple of jokes in here, so ride <laughs> with me, okay? What, <laughs> what impressed me most about being in India or East Africa or Japan was how people seemed to have a very powerful, intimate relationship to objects, and objects of a very small size, even though the significance of these objects was not small in the least. In India, I came upon places where a rock in the center of town, what an art historian might call an aniconic, as opposed to an iconic form, was lovingly attended to by dressing it with cloths and given daily ablutions of honey and milk, or decorated with flowers. What we might call maintenance, they would call worship. And in Africa, clearly, the spiritual resonance of a po Congo power god, not unlike a household saint, was palpable and scary and without question. And in a quieter and altogether different way, so was the rough-hewn Japanese teacup, held tenderly and stared at longingly before sipping the tea, an instrument of meditation. <coughs> These travels made a great impression on me, and I thought that what has been missing from, from current sculpture's lexicon was intimacy. There are very few things we can be that intimate with, be that physically close to, Babies, food, a lover on occasion, a book. That is, unless you're a butterfly collector. Intimacy, that was a joke. <laughs> Intimacy brings us nose to nose with, uh, with the other and allows for a very different quality of looking than the cooler distance in the parallel stance of viewing paintings, viewing pictures, whether they are moving pictures or not. I like to say that looking at sculpture in this regard is like two dogs approaching. How close can I get? Can I get in closer? Can I get in there? Or will I get bitten or licked? Intimacy requires closeness, and in that there is an inherent sense of humility and vulnerability, and I wanted somehow to include aspects of that emotional range in my new sculpture. Here are two pieces from several years back. One on the left is called Strung Out in a Golden Bowl, and it's about as big as a newborn baby, and made of sisal, paper, plaster, wood, gold leaf, and colored pencil. The other is called White and Wicker Fountain, about as big as a large house cat. The wicker was woven by a Roman basket weaver, and the rest is painted wood and rope. Even though these small speculative drawings were never meant to be studies for actual sculpture, especially because I had no initial idea how, to, how they could be made. What did the back look like? How can I build something that looks like smoke or moves? How would they stand up or hold together? And what to do about all this bright color? I had this idea that I would reverse the process. If I was drawing these imaginary things as if they were real, meaning rendered, what if I took fantasy images and rendered them again in material, doubling the fiction? We know two wrongs don't make a right, but it just seemed obvious. Why not just 
make one. This is the drawing and the sculpture that became homespun with a potmian stone. It's skinny, about two feet high. It's made of what I call my home brew, a combination of paper, paper mache, wood, wood putty, and aqua resin. Home brew is an adaptation of hari ko, a technique I learned about in Japan that is used for making puppets and toys. The stone is from the island of Potmos and keeps the sculpture from falling over. This is the drawing and sculpt, oh sorry, uh, yeah, this next one is the drawing and sculpture that became fuchsia unfurls in a gilded cage. It's about as big as a case of wine. Gilded, etched, polished stainless steel and bronze with epoxy coated <coughs> and paper mache. When I was in India, I hoped to work with local craftsmen. I came upon a sholapith carver while in Co Calcutta. Sholapith is a soft reed, like natural styrofoam. He was out of work between puja festivals, meaning prayer festivals, and we tried an experiment. I brought him this drawing and asked him to make this. He said he couldn't make it because he didn't know what it was. And I said, I didn't know what it was either. He said because of the drawing's flatness, he could not see it as a made thing. All of this being translated from Bengali, by the way. I explained to him that no matter what he made would be fine, he'd be paid, and that the drawing was actually like a musical score, and every instrumentalist interprets a score differently. And then I was just curious to see what he would come up with. So he made this tiny thing, about the size of an old-fashioned coffee can. We reworked it together, and later when I got home, I painted it yellow and then added the fountain full of this remarkable material called aerogel, which is like solid smoke, a silica used for the insulation of satellites, the lightest material known to man. Think shaving cream and glass at the same time. I'll talk about materials in just a minute. I just want to continue the size issue now. These are two other small sculptures, each about the size of a bottle of beer. One is held up by these little wooden shims and is made of red flocking and gold leaf on my home brew with wood and wood putty. The other is cast glass, like the Egyptians did, wood veneer and brass. Size versus scale has always been central to the sculptural discourse, and they are different. Size is measured, it is calibrated. Scale is intuitive, it is felt. Size is determined through instruments, rulers, for example. And remember, whether it's inches or centimeters, it's just a matter of the initial system that is applied. Scale is phenomenological. It's about body relationships and proximity. I think a lot about scale and size. And at the same time, I was thinking about how spectacle and sensationalism were capturing the current cultural imagination. Film, television, theater, architecture, let alone cyberspace and virtual reality. How big really is big? I began to kick around this idea of what I like to call scalelessness. I'm prepared to think that this may be a rhetorical conceit, but I like to think it brings up important issues that are entangled in the conversation involving sculpture today. I was speaking before of intimacy and proximity in regards to the small object, and I was also speaking of the speculative imagination as a means of expression in my little travel drawings. So to say this quite simply, by using historical models, a Joseph Cornell box, because it is an instrument of reverie, is possibly bigger than a Richard Serra. Bigger in that the imagination, the dreamscape is bigger or at least in another category of big, because it sidesteps the primacy of body relationships for a potentially infinite and internalized projected space within your mind's eye. Now, this kind of experience has always been more in the realm of certain kinds of painting. The idea that the flat plane can be read, among other ways, as a potentially infinite illusionistic space. Illusion and its magic were ideas that had been shunned in sculpture since the 60s. 
Sculpture had attached itself to a kind of moral imperative. Truth to the materials was espoused, for example. And more importantly, sculpture was required to be knocked off the pedestal as a way of understanding this profound significance, this gravitas of gravity. The pedestal was disdained because it isolated a false illusionistic space removed from the shared space with the viewer. Some even called pedestals privileged and hierarchical. And yet I think this was all a very important part of individuating sculpture as an enterprise that was no longer primarily contingent upon architecture or traditionally cast, carved, or modeled in heavy material and solely based on the human figure. The pedestal was banned. Here are two more little pieces. Upon thinking about all these powerful and intimate objects in my travels, I really was interested in magic, illusion, fiction, the imagination, and what that meant in sculpture. And at that time in the art world, sculpture seemed to be just about anything. And I thought, why can't I put it back on the base? Firstly, double reversing the iconoclastic gesture, even if it's just to challenge the ingrained notion that one couldn't. But mostly to call up this nose-to-nose -nose experience of intimacy, while simultaneously, hopefully, opening that window into a gigantic universe of imaginative projection, like in the Cornell box. The scaleless object par excellence in this context is the DNA model. It is a physical object made for the purpose of representing information in a visually impossible realm, an infinitely tiny dimension. The DNA model is an idea object. And without that scale shift, we could have no means to access its information. Watson and Crick said, after looking at their statistical research, that they could not cohere their information fully until they saw the model. And they couldn't build the model until they could cohere all the information into that physical form, which sounds a lot like making sculpture to me. Now, I'd like to talk about another idea in relationship to these sculptures, and that is what I like to call the expectation of information. The actual DNA model, with its unwieldy helical form, cannot stand up by itself unless it has a stand. And this fits in nicely here as an example, but let me backtrack a bit. I had, for example, this little drawing of what I thought was a sculpture on a trapeze. I thought this was quite funny. I was thinking a lot about Alexander Calder. I was thinking about Italo Calvino's idea about lightness and buoyancy and what he called the leap. And I was thinking about some current art and critical theory as being a little too ponderous. And through looking at Calder again, I started thinking about joy, humor. So I thought, hmm, a sculpture on a trapeze. Why not? And a kind of screaming one at that. And whee! <laughs> I just wanted some awkwardness to be there, along with the challenge to my taste. But mostly, I wanted to bring a buoyancy, a lightness, a joyous, goofy humor into one aspect of the work something you didn't have to figure out or have prior knowledge of, where physical sensation and thought, analysis and experience weren't severed from each other. And this trapeze piece led me to think about stands. Here are two more pieces on stands. One, on a, one cantilevered on a vaudevillian hook with red velvet and stainless steel balls and the other is on a wooden perch, about two feet high. I've always been intrigued with the way that stands are used in ethnographic art and artifacts. Stands for masks, for swords, for tools. Sometimes in a museum display, we only have fragments of some Greek statue. And these are placed, seemingly floating, in proper relationship to each other, 
on what we now might think of as a modernist grid. Or think about stands holding up the equipment in a mad scientist's lab. And the example par excellence for the object on a stand is the globe of the world. Here is an object not only chock full of information, but also capable of bringing up all kinds of fanciful thoughts. What would it be like to go to Antarctica? Where is Islamabad? And then, of course, the globe is just this familiar, wonderful, beautiful, suspended, spinning, painted ball held up to us on a stand. It is, for all we can really see, our world. In a subtly different way, David Smith, the American sculptor, played with a version of this idea when he made a seemingly insignificant intermediary device between the base and the sculpture. A cone, a pyramid, a pin lifted the sculpture up above the table plane or the base plate to make it viewable in a position more like a floating painting. Hudson River landscape here is probably the best example. A stand itself sits in a curious relationship to the sculpture. Is it part of the sculpture or is it a second-class citizen? Are we supposed to pretend it is not there? Is the sculpture so vulnerable that it needs a crutch to hold itself up? All these conditions bring up emotional associations and are therefore fraught with meaning. Along with the association of scientific equipment, as well as objects that we might expect to see in a cabinet of curiosities or a natural history museum, the stand itself connotes that there is an expectation of information within the sculpture. This is black glass clamped down. It is made of hot sculpted glass, and the little white flame is paper mache and string. It has a steel stand that even has some felt pads. The other piece is made of woven wicker with all my travel notes from India collaged onto the Mobius strip. They're each about the size of an old-fashioned TV set. I li I'd like now to shift to talk about materials. In the 60s, when Anthony Caro, the British sculptor, painted his sculptures all one color, he was trying to make a priority of the form over the material, that all the welded parts together, when painted yellow, for example, were just one emphatically singular configuration. When Carl Andre, the American minimalist, laid down plates of magnesium and steel, he was making a point emphasizing the inherent properties of the material itself, any applied color would be disingenuous or arbitrary. I've been thinking that materials can be metaphors. They're not merely arbitrary vehicles that encase an image, that offer up a form. It is clear that lead means something very different than straw, that glass means something very different than felt. Each material singularly has the capability to elicit a myriad of associations, memories, references, along with their obvious intrinsic properties of weight, texture, and color. And within a sculpture, two materials together, for example, might create a spark, a synaptic-like charge, a ringing hum like in a tuning fork, an overtone, a third inexplicable response occurring because the cascade of associations that occurs when one bothers to question what they are both doing there together. This brings up another idea I like to call my kidney transplant theory. Each component part of the sculpture is a necessity. My old girlfriend's daughter used to bring me all kinds of things and say with an adolescent ch challenge and a bite of irony, here. See if you can put that in a sculpture. <coughs> These days, young artists seem to think sculpture is an endless, obsessive accumulation of materials. For me, each component part, no matter how disparate, is there 
like in the kidney transplant, to keep the system alive. And if it doesn't function, if it is rejected, it dies. Methods of making are also metaphors as well. Whether it's handmade, computer generated, fabricated to order by a company, or a craftsman, or even a found object. These differences offer up an abundance of possibility as vocabulary for sculpture. Each method has its own character, its own temperature, and a different consequence for meaning. Welding metal is as different as carving wood as punk rock is from Peter, Paul, and Mary. Now, come on, that was good. <laughs> And, and in sculpture, using an amalgam of unconventional methods and, and materials together ratchets up this notion exponentially. Life and art are just too complex to rely on binary ideas anymore. Black, white, gay, straight, Republican, Democrat, abstract, representational, formal, conceptual. It's just, it's just too pat. The effect that occurs between things, the third thing, the tertium quid, is something I'm particularly interested in. And like metaphor, it is stubborn to explanation. Uh, uh, this piece is called Night and Day Terracotta Bouquet. It has all kinds of materials, woven wicker, braided copper, mirrored plexi, home brew parts painted like the night and day sky, it is as big as a, a big bouquet of flowers. The other is feather, fan, and flame. And it has a working oil lamp with a feather at the end of it. The bronze looks more like earthenware. And the bamboo middle is attached to a red lacquer twisted fan with a piece of Japanese paper that has a watercolor and ink drawing of flames on it like a tattoo. These are two more pieces a little bit smaller. One has gray silk and a mortar and pestle I found in Indonesia and cast blown and crushed plate glass. The other is called red sweater fossil and it's made of knitted wool, straw, painted wood, cast resin and a handmade homebrew shell form. It's about as big as a big loaf of bread. An outgrowth of the idea about materials and metaphors came up when I started using found objects. Although, maybe that's a misnomer. We usually associate found objects in art with what we can easily identify and what we often find in popular culture. This was not my interest. About 25 years ago, I was invited by a company that makes wire to see if I could use any of their products. They made different shapes of wire, square, hexagonal, half round, all by the extrusion process not unlike making pasta. There was a machine with a customized hole and a heater, and material was passed through it. I didn't think there was anything there with the wire that I wanted, but in the corner of the factory, I saw a big pile of stuff, and the foreman told me that those were the mistakes, that occasionally the machine stops up, and, has a, and as the material is fed in, it is also backing away from the heater cooling while not going through the hole. And these wild accidents are produced. They are the calcified evidence of time, a man-made yet natural form. They look like magma. What interested me most about these forms was that they were completely anonymous, utterly confusing, incredibly unidentifiable. One had no idea what they were or how they came to be made especially if the surface would be treated. These goofy chunks of material accident came into my hands right around the same time I began to learn about Chinese scholars' rocks. Chinese scholars' rocks are the ultimate anonymous sculpture, usually presented on customized, ornate, lacquered stands, by the way. They are very old rocks, often riddled with nooks and crannies, that were dredged up from the lakes in southern China. They are placed on a scholar or a poet's desk as an instrument of reverie, a device for dreaming, 
an aid for inspiration. They are the empty ciphers for the poet to project upon. They are the best example of the Duchampian notion that the viewer completes the creative act. They are just mutely there, but with the highest degree of artifice. This piece is called Saffron Writer's Block with Blowback. The saffron colored form is actually a piece of this extruded aluminum. There is also a piece of crushed paper sitting on the sculpture, which is actually a rejected manuscript page from a novel written by an old girlfriend that I took from her trash. <laughs> there seemed to be a connection between the two. The other sculpture has at its bottom these little white curly leaves, which are actually painted extruded copper from the wire company's mistakes. One other comment that illustrates this idea about the consequence and effect of juxtaposing disparate materials is best explained by referring to Degas' famous little dancer. You know this little ballerina wearing a real tutu and a real satin hair ribbon. And apparently in the original wax version, there was real hair on her head as well. What was so interesting about the Degas little dancer is that it confused people terribly that the rendered realism of its classical modeling was butted up against the actual reel of the found tutu and the ribbon. It made everyone so uncomfortable. What was real and what was not? What was art and what was not? And where were the lines supposed to be drawn? And why put these disparate things together? It was actually quite a scandal. And yet, it was a gentle, quiet, some thought ugly, humble little thing. Degas never cast anything in bronze in his lifetime. I believe he wanted these wax sculptures to be just that, anti-heroic, studio experiments modeled out of viscous material like the paint that he was so familiar with. They are made in the studio, they were made in the studio, at the table, like three-dimensional drawings which is how I like to think about my work. Desk work, like an architect or a mathematician, the hobbyist that makes the ship in the bottle, or the kid building a model airplane. Not a big production. I don't like tools. I just like sitting there at the table, staring down and trying to have an idea, have a form. Here are two more recent pieces gold and gourds on a marble pillow, because that is what it is. And marooned in mirror <coughs> with blue ballerina, my nod to Degas. I want to leave you now with what I fear is a very grandiose statement, and I am hesitant to make it. But what I would really like to say is that my task, my goal, is to make something that you've never seen before. I'm mostly interested in that experience that you might have asking the simple but obvious question, what is this thing? And what am I doing here asking the question, what is this thing? You might then ask yourself, what am I doing here? And possibly then, how do I take from the fullness of this specific experience with a sculpture and bring it back out into the world as I question other unknown things and unknown events. And how do these other unknown things and events raise more and contingent questions? And the spiral of meaning endlessly loops out into the world, but also flashes back like an echo on that particular and private experience one had with being with the sculpture, which has now unwittingly become an instrument for consciousness raising. And in that, a larger social meaning is at hand. This is pom-pom battery. It's about as big as a watermelon. It's made of mold-blown glass, some Shola pith pom-poms from the Kali Temple in Calcutta. And here is a recent drawing of pom-pom battery from a series I am doing of before, during, and after <coughs> each sculpture. 
Here are a couple of more recent pieces. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the fun part for me is if you have questions. And I know it's a university, you're all very shy and you don't like to ask questions. Excellent. Um, it seems like in some of the earlier slides, you had some of the questions that were asked and you had some kind of opposing or contrasting <coughs> material or shape or structure that could come together Yeah, that's a kind of difficult question to answer. I mean, it's true that my earlier work had a, had a kind of um, a form that would house a smaller form in it. And I have a number of ideas sort of relating to why that is. Um, nothing that I could answer that simply. But in fact, I, I like the idea that, that this larger structure actually held some smaller thing within it, almost as if the smaller thing was the featured sculpture and this was the device that offered it to you. So that was one idea I had. The other idea that I was very interested in is, I'm very interested in, in mathematics. And there's something, uh, a branch of mathematics called topology, which has to do with the deformation. So the twists and bends and what, what a mathematician would call torus, toroidal, meaning a donut shape, um, have a certain kind of complexity that I felt had a metaphorical meaning in sculpture. We all, like for example, in topology talks about knots, twists, and bends. And we all understand the visceral nature of a knot, a twist, and a bend. The emotional character of a knot and a twist and a bend. And that kind of... Um, meaning that we can bridge between the information of the mathematics, whether we know mathematics or not, and the emotion of how the thing sits as a form in terms of our relationship with it body to body. So the earlier work had a more, let's say, um, consistent kind of formal theme that now I've actually been trying to break open. Yes? Um, before you were talking about sort of the world beyond like what you're seeing and everything. So I guess the question would be, do you imagine these things as relating to this world? Or do you imagine them more as glimpses into that expansive alternate? I mean, like are these like portals through which we're seeing something else or do you relate them to this world? You, you watch a lot of science fiction movies, huh? Um, no, I think it's very well said what you said, and um, I guess the, the quick, simple answer is both. Um, you know, I, I have a funny story to say. I, I, when I first started making this work, and was, again, when installation was sort of the reigning mainstream mode of sculpture, um, I had a number of people feel that my sculpture was very peculiar. People still do. And, um, I had a number of people say to me, which I think I've decided to turn into a compliment, even though I know it wasn't. They said to me, I don't know how to look at your sculpture. And I thought that was fascinating because obviously, as Donald Judd said, it's right here. Look at it. But what was interesting is that a number of people felt some kind of uncomfortable sense that they didn't exactly know what it was or what it would connect to. And I really like the idea that there is no requisite backstory to my work the way there is into a lot of what I would call late conceptual art. Um, kids love my work because they don't question, like, why don't I have enough information to enter into this without prior experience? Um, and there are a number of as you would call them, portals into the work. 
Sometimes it could be just color. Or possibly some form reminds you of something that you saw in the desert or underwater. Or um, maybe you do know something about mathematics. Or, you know, th there's a whole host of entries into the work. And I think it's available for all different individuals. And as, as I like to say, you know, art making is an expression of the individual, although it also has a great deal to do with tradition, history, and information. And I think looking at art also is a form of expression for the individual. And yet, it is enhanced and enriched with more history and information. So it's, it's not an either or question. And, and if anything, one of the themes of what I was trying to talk about is, I think either or is over. You know, we are in a much more richly complex experience of being in the world, let alone being in your head at this point. Uh, I think several of us have heard Shalau, wonderful music. Can we go to the studio? Oh, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's great. We were really enjoying it. But, um, but I, was, I was wondering, no, don't be sorry. I was wondering um, if you could talk about things of uh, the music that you have well, it's funny that you bring that up because, you know, I, I've given a lot of lectures. I love to talk about art. I teach a lot. Um, and yet, you know, I've been doing this a long time now. And when I was a y much younger artist, I felt that I needed to justify everything I did. I needed it to be defensible and theoretically rigorous. And those things were very important to me. And to some degree, they may still be. But um, I'm very interested in a um, jazz musician named Ornette Coleman that some of you may or may not know. He is the father of what's called free jazz, which really was in the late 50s, early 60s. And if you've ever heard Ornette Coleman, you'll understand my story. If you haven't, it won't work as well. But um, one of the things that I'm interested in, to go back to uh, this woman's question, is that there's a kind of an immediacy of experience that you should be able to have. When, when people listen to music, they don't ask the questions that they often ask with contemporary art. Like, what's it about? Or, I can't figure it out. Or, tell me the backstory, Or something like that. There's a great line that Frank Stella, uh, the painter, said, actually about baseball instead of music, but I'll compare it. He said, um, although it's a, a real uh, period piece, way too early for you all to know, maybe, but. He said, uh, when Mickey Mantle steps up to the plate and he hits the ball out of the park, nobody asks him what it means. <laughs> and one of the things, if you know Ornette Coleman, this gets back to the musicality, Ornette Coleman is like the king of screechy jazz. <laughs> and um, you know, at this point, uh, I've been doing this a long time. I've been way out on a limb. My work is not in fashion, or I don't know, I don't even know if it's possible to have a fashion now. But I feel one of the things I really like to do is, okay, I know what I'm doing, and I just want to do it. I want to grab my horn, I want to step up to the mic, and I want to blow. <laughs> and that's it. And what's interesting is I've gotten to be able to do that. And that has been the greatest gift. And I'm grateful for it. Yes. Uh, 20 years ago, when you were here, uh, were you here? Yeah. Really? It's a province. Maybe you were in So we're upstairs in the second floor of the museum in a piece called Soul Bell, I believe. Soul Bell, yes. And you were talking about um, <coughs> sort of like things that were difficult, difficult to make, difficult to process. <coughs> and then you said, Difficult to digest. He said, uh, forgive me for quoting you. He said, I want these things to be like a, uh, a chicken bone stuck in your throat. Oh, you have a really good memory. That, <laughs> that is one of my canned lines. It's, it's not every day that you hear something like that, but what, what strikes me is um, what I perceive as a real shift in terms of, of uh, you know, that, that idea of a chicken bone stuck in your throat. A little unpleasant, and I, I don't, I don't sense that 
in, in this way. I'm curious if you can talk about maybe why then and why now. That's a, very, that's a really, really good question. Um, I didn't show any of my early work, so you wouldn't know. But my, my old work was a lot pointier and scratchier, and I was very interested in things like medieval armor and samurai ha helmets and things. And, um, and I guess also I was a bit of an angry young man, as you know, we're, sometimes we all can be. And I, my work had a thorny quality to it. And, I guess I was, um, you know, somewhat health, healthily pissed off at the world and the art world. And I, I, I think that I wanted the experience of a work of art to not be, and this is another one of my canned lines, what I call vanilla ice cream, which is, you know, like when you say to one of your students, like, who's your favorite artist? And you're looking at their paintings, and they're painting, I don't know what, fruit or something. And I say, I like Picasso. And it's like. But that doesn't tell me anything about you. Picasso is vanilla ice cream. It just goes down too easy. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't think Picasso is a great artist, I mean, in, in that context. So I did want the work to kind of hurt so that you'd remember it. And I don't know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I still hope there's a bit of chicken bone left in my work, honestly. Uh, one of the things that's difficult to see, both in slides, but I even think, even in an exhibition, is the work has a lot of detail. And the, one of the things that really is important to me, as opposed to, let's say, my, the generation that I was raised by, that I was taught by, let's say the minimalists, my work, I hope and I believe, is impossible to memorize. So you, you have to keep going back. And suddenly, the way you stack the priorities of attention in terms of details or aspects that you didn't see is a cert, there's a certain kind of lasting quality, I hope. And um, I suppose that that's maybe a softer version of, a, of the chicken bone. But I, I wouldn't want to give the chicken bone up. <laughs> yes? I think there's a certain playfulness. I, mean, I wasn't here to do the But there's a certain playfulness now that maybe we weren't so, we wasn't so manly before. But you, know, you can do it now. But I, I think there's also a play of clothes and the use of color. And I was wondering, um, is it, uh, do you know ahead of time what the color's going to be, or is it something that changes as you work, or is uh, do you, yeah, like you showed the drawings and the color was pretty much like the drawings. In a piece like that, do you know that those things are going to be red and the things inside are going to be blue and lavender, or is it something that changes as you work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my work is very precise and specific, and I mean it to be. But my working process is a lot funkier and organic than it would appear from looking at the work. I'm a terrible slob. Um, and I would say, to answer your question more specifically, uh, both. Sometimes I know exactly what I'm going to do, and I do it. And sometimes I know exactly what I'm going to do, and it looks terrible. And this is all part of the kidney transplant um, theory. But also, on the other side, about playfulness, although when people tell me my work is so fun and whimsical and playful, it absolutely makes me cringe. Although, of course, it is. And there's something that I want to include in there. I just don't want it to be insipid um, or saccharine. So you know, I tend to always talk more on the sides of heaviness. So that's an aspect that is very complicated for me, because often when people write about my work, particularly if it's not in, a, in an art context, they say, oh, it's so fun. You know, and I just hate that. Although, I do want it to be fun. I just don't want it to be misunderstood. You know. But in fact, you know, on the second part of uh, the angry young man thing, whatever you said before, I have had a number of people, and I think this is just you know, sexual stereotypes and things like that. But many people think that my work was made by a woman because I use lightweight material. I use a lot of color, or all these kind of silly stereotypes that obviously don't really work anymore in the world, but default. And, and honestly, when you're a, you know, and, uh, actually, I'm, I lost some weight, but when you're, a, when you're a big, bald, straight, white guy, everybody thinks, and you're a sculptor, everybody thinks you own a pickup truck, 
have a welding machine, smoke camel straights, and make sculpture out of chains and boulders. And you know, <laughs> I'm much more interested in the ballet. So you know, I have something else to say. Uh, John, can you talk a little bit about um, the practice, the, the things that you engage in as a younger artist that are important to you um, in terms of your growth and development that allow you to work with um, a certain amount of flow at this point. And I think your work appears very effortless and one might say easy. And, and I'm, I haven't seen the work, but I'm, I'm positive it is not easy and it is not effortless, but it appears that way. Now, I hear a lot of students talk about style and personal sort of um, uh, their personal expression. And though you want to aim towards that, it's, it's such a hard thing to, to get at, even if, and it's not even guaranteed that you get to it. So for the younger artists um, in, the, in the audience, what were some of the things that you did uh, continually that you know, helped lead to, to the place, the fertile place where you are now? Wow, that's a complicated question. Um, I guess I could tell a funny story that, you know, when I went to Yale Graduate School, um, it was the height of conceptual art and the Vietnam War protests and um, everything was about being radical. And it was the reason why I was interested in art because I never went to art school before graduate school. As a matter of fact, I never studied art. Um, even worse, I never made anything. So when I went to, you know, when I was in graduate school, nobody made things. We read Wittgenstein, you know, and sat around and talked about, um, uh, you know, Levi Strauss and things like that. And I actually think it's sort of hilarious that I make things. I mean, my father was a professor of theoretical ling linguistics. If if we had to change a light bulb, he'd call the electrician. So. <laughs> I, I, have in, I sort of invented a way to make things myself, slowly over time. And, and because my things have a certain precision and fineness, you know, people think that I'm this great craftsman, when in fact I'm not. What I am is I'm really embarrassed over the fact that I don't really know how to make anything, and I want to make it as carefully as I can so I won't be ridiculed. Even though I love artists that really show the funk, and I'm I fight with this all the time. I would love to show the funk, but somehow I don't. So that's what I do. As far as um, personal expression versus style in terms of young artists, which I think is a real can of worms for young artists, let alone teachers these days, is of course art is a personal expression. There's no question about it. It is an individual making. But we also live in this moment, this absolutely awful moment, where what's the reigning mechanism of standards is the marketplace as opposed to what used to be the authoritarian mainstream art critic of the moment. That was bad enough. <laughs> but now there's the, a need or a, uh, an idea that to be a successful artist, let alone young artist, one has to have a consistent style, often called branding, which I can't even believe is an acceptable term for artists. But in fact, it is. So I, I think that, that fight for young artists is very, very difficult. And the way I dealt with something like it, although God knows in the early 70s, you could still almost feel that you knew everybody in the art world, which, of course, you can't know that now. Um, so the art world was quite small. And the art world is not small now. Um, The way I dealt with it, I think, is by, and, and, and this also might sound a little grandiose, but I think at the time it seemed possible. Now, in the age of Google, it's impossible. But the way I dealt with it is I tried to know everything. I read all the books. I went to hear music. I, I read every catalog. I actually read them. One of the things I can't stand is going into a young artist's studio and seeing their paintings and say, oh, God, that's interesting. Have you ever heard of Gorky? And they say, Gorky, wait a second. Is that Gorky? And you know you have to say like, well, no, well, yes, it, 
And, and then you come back two weeks later and you say, gee, how the painting's going along? Did you, did you get something out of Gorky? And they say, who's Gorky? Wait a second. Is that Gorky? So there's no traction to memory anymore because of Google. And artists without visual memory and the traction for visual memory lose their vocabulary and tend to want to reinvent the wheel. And it's a waste of time. And they justify it by saying it's my personal expression, which is horseshit. <laughs> so, you know, you have to have, as I like to say sometimes, studying contemporary art is very confusing. On the one hand, it's as complex as quantum mechanics or chess. And you really have to know an, an enormous amount of information to appreciate the subtlety and the nuance of what its meaning is. And yet, on the other hand, it's you blowing your horn. And somehow that has to get fused together in a real and organic way to become an artist. Yeah. On that note, I wanted to ask you about the educated viewer versus, you know, say somebody that does not know about art and doing their work. I think they're like they could be on it is part of it. So uh, I guess just to share about your experience as an artist and then uh, thinking about your art and how do you do it? Because to me, I always tell Yeah, wow, that's a complicated question. Um, only because I mean, what I'd really like to say is I really don't think about the viewer in that example that I gave about sitting at my desk. You know, you make, you make room scaled installations, or at least some of your work is that. I, I looked in your catalog. And of course, an installation, which is a fairly new mode in regard <coughs> to sculpture. As I was saying before, in the 70s, sculpture was a word that was meaningless as sculpture is an object. Sculpture was everything that wasn't painting. And what happened was is that Sculpture as an object became um, discredited a lot because of the theoretical discourse of the, of the 80s that talked about commodity fetishism, that a, an object was too easily bought and sold. And therefore, an installation or something like an earthwork had some kind of way to both challenge, sidestep, and critique all the problems with commodity fetishism which is absolute crap, because now you can buy a Bill Viola installation and build a wing on your house for it when you're a rich man in Spain, and you pay $500,000 instead of paying, let's say, $50,000 for the object. This is all a big problem with uh, the mode of contemporary art. But getting back closer to your question is, what's happened now is the operative model of what sculpture has come to mean is installation. People expect to see a show. They won't go into a gallery. They go into a museum. They need to see a completely coordinated envelope that they enter into, like theater. And that's pretty much the basis of contemporary three-dimensional work. And I very purposely tried not to make that kind of a thing. So in a sense, it's not that I don't care about the viewer. Of course I do. I'm being a little hard now. But in a sense, it's, it's, it's not the kind of thing. I don't, I'm, I'm not a theater director. Um, I think a lot of artists are excellent at doing that kind of thing. But I have no interest in it. So it, I'm, I'm more like a monk doing an illuminated manuscript. I mean, I just, you know, that's it. And one of my biggest problems, and this is why the title of the show and the funny, well, it, you haven't seen the show yet, but when you see it, one of my biggest problems, which is the exact opposite of the problem of installation, is I always have such a terrible time showing my work in galleries. 
Because now the expectation of the gallery is the show. Like Ed Reinhardt, the painter, said, I'm not in show business. I don't make a show. I make a painting. Well, I guess my question is, you often show in galleries. So I, I have to. Right. So I think, and, and, I mean, to show in a gallery, I guess uh, people that come to the gallery are, uh, somehow claim themselves as viewers. So I guess, uh, I don't know, it's a question as far as Because from hearing your lecture, there's a lot of you know, historical and conceptual, I and mean, you're referring to a lot of things that I think is very informative. I didn't say they were my favorite. I just said that they are they they often like my work because they don't worry about the backstory. Yeah. Um, I you know I I, I we could kind of go round and round on this. I it's not that I'm not it's not that I don't want people to look at these things. Meaning I'm not interested in the viewer. But. When I'm in my studio, basically I think about my work in terms of, like I said, almost like a three-dimensional drawing. I'm not thinking too much about how it's going to be. I'm thinking about what and why it's going to be. Sadly, I have to put it out there in some place, and then suddenly all these questions, let's say like the pedestal. What's really interesting is when I was a student, the whole issue of putting a sculpture on a pedestal was so provocative and polemical. I mean, there are fist fights over it, you know? And now what's interesting, when I go to the Lower East Side in New York and you see all these new young generation of artists, nobody cares about the pedestal anymore. It's like a non-issue. I, I mean, I think it's fascinating. So I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to work out my own problems, you know, my mother, <laughs> the pedestal. <laughs> They're not that different. <laughs> you got to have a place to stand. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, a lot of your sculpture tends to have uh, like a very round, almost biomorphic elements uh, with a transition, uh, either either housing some other element, like uh, like what was brought up earlier, or <laughs> completely changing into another not only material, but a completely different form. And I was wondering, to me, that like the way that you put on this is that transition. And I was wondering how you negotiate, not only from a drawing to sculpture, but then once you, you get into the work, how you, how you move from one, one material, one idea to the next. Yeah. Well, that, you, you sort of brought up three different things, all of which are quite relevant for me. Firstly, the rounded thing, although I hate the word biomorphic. Um, I am very interested in curves. And I'm interested in curves for all the reasons that everyone's interested in curves. You know, I mean, it's, it feels good. Um, and I, 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 I mean that. You know, I like the idea that, like, I used to tease that, like, in, in Western art, you're not supposed to touch. In Asian and African art, often, you are supposed to touch. And my work, I like to tease, makes you want to sneak a touch. It's like the subway. You know, you know you shouldn't, but you'd like to, you know? So curves are, it's, a, it's basically about sex. And that's a good thing. But wait, 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 wait. So, well, yes and no. You know, yes and no. I mean, I think, I think there's something. The Germans have a word called Fingerspitzengefühl, which means fingertip sensitivity, meaning you can actually, it's like seeing with the feeling. But it actually also means intuition. You know, like I get a feeling for you, and I don't know if I want to know you any, you know. And, mm. So there's a certain what's called haptic experience, meaning how you perceive it through its feel. And that, first of all, I think is one of the basis of sculpture, but it's very important to my sculpture. That, that, that's A. B, the next thing that you brought up was this, the transition from the materials. And that is like my big problem. And uh, rather than talking about me, I'll tell you a cute story. So there's this very famous sculptor, American sculptor named John Chamberlain, who was a big burly guy, and he made Car, uh, sculpture out of crushed cars. And he was somebody who I greatly admired. 
And I had the opportunity once when I was a young artist, I was on some panel in like Madison, Wisconsin, because they paid my airfare and gave me $200. And I thought, great, you know? And I get on the plane, and who else is on the panel? John Chamberlain. I'm thinking, God, why does he need $200, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I thought, wow, John Chamberlain, I'm going to try and talk to him, you know? So I tried to talk to him, and he's sort of a famous drunk, and he didn't really want to talk. And I'm bugging him, and he says to me, you know what sculpture's all about, kid? And I said, no. And he said, fit. And I thought, wow. <laughs> that was fantastic. And I've never forgotten. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.